terrorists. This was part of a conference on the threat of global terrorism co-hosted by the group Women in International Security and the U.S. Army War College. This is an hour and a half. Okay, we're going to uh, start the second panel now, uh, which is on environments that enable terrorism, kind of following up on the discussion we had just earlier. Uh, my name is Doug McDonald. I'm with the Strategic Studies Institute of the United States Army War College as a visiting professor in, um, a re visiting research professor in, in national security affairs. My home base actually is Colgate University in upstate New York, which is under about 50 feet of snow, as I understand it as we speak. Uh, we have a wonderful panel today, uh, starting off uh, with, uh, uh, I'm in absentia, I will introduce Ambassador David Shin, uh, who will be here. He's on his way. He was broadcasting with Voice of America, as I understand it, and is now on his way en route here, um, who was a foreign service officer uh, who served in embassies all over the world and former ambassador to Burkina Faso in Ethiopia. Uh, he also has a Ph.D. in political science from George Washington University, where he is currently an adjunct professor. Um, to my right here is Dr. C. Christine Fair, who is a senior research associate in the Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention <clears throat> at the United States Institute of Peace, where she specializes in South Asian political and military affairs. Uh, she is a graduate of uh, the University of Chicago, where you also got your Ph.D., right? Regrettably. <laughs> Regrettably. <laughs> Another satisfied customer from Absolutely. Chicago. Yes. <laughs> Uh, next to Christine is, is, I come from Columbia, we do the same thing, uh, is Dr. Matthew Levitt, who's a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he directs the Institute's Stein Program on Terrorism, Intelligence, and Policy. From uh, 2005 to early 2007, Dr. Levitt served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, he has a doctorate from Tufts University's Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Medford, Massachusetts. So I think uh, we uh, won't wait for the ambassador to come. He will join us as soon as he can. We'll start off with Christine. All right. I just got new glasses. It's like the third pair that keeps going up the axis, so I can't really read this terribly well. So I'm just going to kind of wing it. And hopefully you'll be uh, forgiving of my near blindness. Plus, if, if you can see, the light up here is really strange. It's like being in a prison cell. So I'm going to talk about, uh, <laughs> oh, too much caffeine. I'm going to talk about these alleged connections between Pakistan's religious seminaries, or, or madrasas, or madaras is the plural if you prefer, and militancy. So we've all heard repeatedly that Pakistan is the most important partner in the global war on terrorism, that it's captured and detained more al-Qaeda terrorists than any other partner. But of course, this is because, as we all know, Pakistan has so many terrorists to capture and detain. So reflecting um, this reality, uh, I don't know, circa 2000, Jessica Stern pointed us in the direction of Pakistan's religious seminaries, or the Madaris. And after 9-11, these religious seminaries continued to attract attention and were consistently labeled as weapons of mass instruction, militant production factories, and, and things of this nature. A couple of years ago, um, we started seeing a corrective literature that began asking, well, you know what's really puzzling? We don't actually see madrasa graduates popping up in actual militant organizations or tanzims. And so you have this sort of parallel literature that I will call sort of exculpatory. And um, I think we can also consider these to be supply-side studies and that they're looking at the characteristics of militant supply. So as someone who hangs out in Pakistan, I've been pretty perplexed by how you can have so many really smart people coming up with completely contradictory findings. Now, um, in my program at USIP, I've had a couple of projects where I've been trying to resolve these, these empirical differences in terms of points of view about the madrasas. And I'm going to present a framework that I think resolves some of these differences, and I'd be interested in hearing your feedback. So some of the, just like maybe it might be useful to rehearse, you know, some of the more prominent, what I think are ill-founded presumptions about madrasas. I mean, the first thing that, that we've heard is that from the International Crisis Group, perhaps the most influential report, is that something like 33 percent 
of students in Pakistan attend madrasas. Well, I've been going to Pakistan since 1991. That number just seemed crazy to me to begin with. But it turns out the reason why it seems crazy is that it was crazy. Um, the International Crisis Group had an excellent report, and its fl fatal flaw happened to be division. So when they took the number of madrasas, which happened to be collected uh, through interviews with important Pakistani officials, and they divided by the, numer the denominator of the total number of enrolled students, they divided by 1.9 million instead of 19 million. So when you actually then go back and redo the math, 33% really comes out to more like 4 to 7% depending upon the range of estimates for the number of madrasa students. When you look at household-based surveys, a completely different picture emerges from the 33%. Um, household-based surveys, and we're talking about the Pakistani census, the, integrated, the Pakistani integrated household survey, they come up with numbers like less than 1%. Now, there's some important caveats. Household-based surveys don't get folks who aren't in households, like, for example, if you're an orphan, and things of this nature. But it does appear, given that these estimates are in the range of the corrected ICG estimates, that we're looking maybe 8% of students attend madrasas. Um, another important area of sort of confusion has been the actual number of madrasas. And so you're going to see ranges that, I don't know, 50,000 madrasas were, uh, was actually suggested by one author. Yet when you look at government surveys of madrasas, you actually see numbers like 7,000 for 2001. So clearly there's a lot of empirical ambiguity about how many of these things there are. Um, again, turning to household surveys, irrespective of how many they are, they do appear to enjoy a relatively low share of the educational market. Another area of empirical, I think, silliness has been the characterization of madrasa students in terms of their socioeconomic background. I mean, how many times have we heard these are poor students, these are the schools of last resort? But the data really don't support that. If you look at the findings of the uh, Sustainable Policy Development Institute, a think tank in Pakistan, as well as by some World Bank studies, what you actually see is that the socioeconomic background of students in madrasas resemble very much um, the students who are in public schools. So to, to, to put some fine point on it, in fact, 12% of madrasa students, compared to about 10% or so in public schools, come from the most uh, wealthy families in Pakistan with um, household average annual incomes well in excess of 250,000 rupees. So I'm just going through this literature to, to suggest that much of the so-called conventional wisdom, when actually benchmarked against <coughs> what I'll call uh, survey data, don't appear to be very wise or even conventional. The, and then, of course, I think the most important conundrum that persists are these consistent purported linkages between madrasas and militants, uh, militant organizations, but when you actually look at the backgrounds of militants, you actually don't see very many of them coming from madrasas. So what in the world is going on? Well, a couple of years ago, I stumbled across a paper by Ethan Bueno de Mosquita called The Quality of Terror. And I think that Ethan's insights actually are very useful for trying to square these very different findings about madrasas. Um, basically, Ethan's thesis goes like this. Militant groups, like a military, for that matter, um, basically have the luxury of recruiting on quality, provided that the demand for those militant skills is greater than the actual, or is less than the actual supply of willing militants. Now, in the case of Pakistan, most of these tanzims or these militant groups actually have missions of only maybe a hundred or, or maybe several thousand. So, I think it's fair to assume that the numbers of people that would like to become militants exceed the actual demand that tanzims actually have for them. So, rather than exculpating madrasas and concluding that madrasas are completely innocent, we actually have a very different picture that could possibly emerge. Maybe Jessica Stern is right. When she went out and she interviewed various students at madrasas, maybe madrasa students do have a higher taste for jihad, all else equal. And in fact, I'm going to present some data later in this discussion that suggests that's the case. But as long as militants have the opportunity, or militant recruiters have the opportunity of selecting on quality, they don't necessarily have to take these madrasa-educated graduates. So in the paper um, that I'm talking about today, I kind of lay out a different way of thinking about it. And it draws very heavily upon my days as a military manpower analyst 
at RAND, or I got to work with these great military manpower economists like Beth Ash and Bruce Orvis. Rather than looking at militants in Pakistan in an undifferentiated lot and trying to answer the question, are madrasas guilty or are they not? How many are them and do we care? I think it's actually more useful to, to take a more disaggregated look at the militant market. So militant groups in Pakistan, they can be distinguished by you know, several different factors. Are they primarily sectarian? Do they primarily focus on Afghanistan? Do they primarily focus on Kashmir? Um, the ethnicity of the recruits, the kinds of connections that they have to other local militant groups um, or transnational militant groups like Al-Qaeda. And if you take a look, if you sort of divide up militant groups in this way, and then you then look at, well, what kind of operations do they mostly engage in? It becomes very clear that these groups have very different human capital requirements. And it would make sense that they would recruit um, individuals who fulfill those human capital needs. So let me just give you a very basic example. Let's take a group like lashkar e taiba lashkar e taiba operates in India. Some people say it operates in Bangladesh. Certainly operates in Indian-held Kashmir. Now, if you think about how difficult it is to get to these theaters, this is not something that your average Joker Joe is going to be able to pull off. The first thing they have to do, um, let's just say they, you know, they've, they've gotten through the basic screen um, and they've, they've undertaken the path to becoming a militant. And Lushkar Taiba has its own, its own pathway for recruiting, training, and missioning people. But you have to get to theater. Now, getting to theater means, in most cases, crossing the line of control. The line of control is, for those of you who've gone trekking in Kashmir or similar terrains know, it's really not easy um, to operate in that environment. Plus, you have a very active counterinsurgency grid. Now, back in the day when these groups could infiltrate with impunity, i.e. when the U.S. wasn't pressuring Pakistan to knock it off, you would actually have 30 or so militants inserting at one time. And when they would insert, they would have what I'll call the really high-value assets, which are going to be the guides. You know, now, now, in recent years, partly because they've had to, they've gotten away from having these, um, these guides on retainer, and many groups have developed their own. Um, scouts and guides. But back in the day, the guides were high value assets. They would insert people from all different sorts of groups. And of course, you'd have your porters who lived in the area. So one person who is, how shall we say, a Joker Joe, compromises not only his mission, but the mission of all of the other militants with whom he's being inserted. Now, those insertion packets have decreased in recent years, but they are still inserted in packets. Once they're in Kashmir, they have to maintain operational security. Um, I know when I go to India, people know immediately that I learned my Urdu in Pakistan. They're very spe Pakistan-specific vocabulary items. So you have to be very careful um, to not reveal your origins. And to a discerning person who's sort of looking out for this stuff, it's actually fairly easy to uh, reveal your origins if you're not careful. You have to be basically literate and numerate. Um, I remember a couple years ago, I was up at 15th Corps, and I was looking through the militant manuals. These guys can do fractions. Um, they had, in English, um, very detailed description on how to build IEDs from things that were locally available. You know, they had um, the active ingredients in certain compounds, and these were in English. So it really struck me that you're probably not, in most madrasas, going to get the sort of human capital um, that many of these groups acquire. And that's just to operate in Kashmir. If you're going to move into Delhi, as we saw with Lashkar Atayaba, um, the Mumbai attacks from the summer, this is even a further skill set, which is much more rigorous. Now, let's contrast that with, um, and I almost hesitate to bring this group up because what we've seen, and they've, they've, they've recently repurposed in the tribal areas, but until very recently, you take Lushkar e Jungvi. It's, a, it's an anti-Shia sectarian group. Actually, they were one of the, the, in, the pioneers of suicide terrorism in Pakistan. It's not hard to get to theater. They're in the theater. Uh, all of the, the issues that I talked about Lushkar Taib are not really barriers for, Lush, for Lushkar and Jungvi recruits. So if I were to be a guessing person and I were to ask, well, where, where might I see a Madrasa graduate? My money would be on Lushkar and Jungvi. Um, one would also add that perhaps as a sectarian outfit, um, Madrasa backgrounds may confer even special operational benefits to a Lushkar and Jungvi operative. So now what I can't talk about right now, because I, don't exact, I haven't finished the analysis to sort of test some of these hypotheses, I did field a survey in Pakistan 
of about 140 families of militants, and I'd be more than happy to talk about that offline, but we're still doing the preliminary analysis, but I can tell you this much. Um, when we're looking at the madrasa backgrounds of these students, many of these hypotheses that I walked you through, in fact, bore out. So I, I'd like to, to summarize with, it with, a, with a few notes. If we think about madrasas as sort of a supply side problem, the good news is that there probably aren't that many madrasas in Pakistan that have these very explicit ties. The bad news is that operating against them is very, very difficult. Um, we've seen in FATA, um, the U.S. can take unilateral action against some of these known madrasas, but only with extreme domestic fallout. And irrespective of what you think about Musharraf and his role in the global war on terrorism, this administration likes him. They want to protect him, and they're cognizant that when they take these, these actions unilaterally, they compromise him. We can't really rely necessarily on the Pakistanis to do this job because both their capability as well as their willingness is deeply suspect. And that is a fact, despite working with the U.S. Army and after the infusion of a lot of funds, monetary and otherwise, they still are incapable of waging an effective counterinsurgency in Fatah, although the U.S. Army doesn't necessarily do counterinsurgency very well either. So we can't beat up Pakistan for doing things that uh, we don't do terribly well. <coughs> Um, and we can't uh, really expect Pakistan to take an effective law and order approach, i.e. arrest these people, um, particularly in areas like Fatah where there are no extant police forces. So the good news is there aren't that many of them. The bad news is what do you do about them? Um, this represents an enormous policy trade-off. But I think what we're not seeing when we look at madrasas, and I think this kind of came up when we talked about survey work, public diplomacy, Madrasas may present a larger, what I'll call, demand side problem. So if we talk about the supply of militant manpower, I'm going to talk about what's the demand for terrorism as a product. Um, there have been a number of surveys. They, they're problematic empirically, and we can talk about why in terms of their sampling and the way in which the questions are asked. But there have been a couple of surveys, one of which involved interviewing 500 students and teachers of, of kids at madrasas, public schools and private schools. Incidentally, public schools uh, enjoy about 70% of the educational market. 30 go to private schools and the remainder go to madrasas. So again, you're getting an idea of how relevant this important madrasa issue is by looking at the uh, market share they enjoy or don't enjoy. But the survey data are actually quite interesting. When, when, when you look at what these kids said about do you support jihadi groups? Do you support outright war with Pakistan? Do you support minority rights like Ahmadiyyas and Hindus in Pakistan, women's rights? One thing is very clear. These madrasa students are not people I want to live next door to. Um, overwhelmingly, they support jihad. Overwhelmingly, they support uh, outright war with India. And overwhelmingly, they do not support uh, rights for minorities and women in Pakistan. And their teachers are even more frightening. But if you just covered up your hand over that column and you look at the public school students, you'll see that the public school students don't fare terribly uh, more uh, in terms of their tolerance. In fact, they're really quite similar in their worldview. And so this left me to the conclusion, um, going back again to my military manpower days, um, one of the most important predictors of whether or not an individual will enlist in the military is the view of their influencers i.e. parents, grandparents, relatives, friends, etc. Do their friends have a high opinion of the military? Do their influencers support the cause of that, of that military? So going back to the context of militancy and, and the madrasa issue, it may be that from a supply side perspective, madrasas may represent some containable threat. I'll be surely it's a challenge to contain it. But the thought I'd like to leave you with, and all of our efforts to think about you know, the madrasa issue that comes up in the 9-11 report, it's come up recently in House Resolution Number 1, we've completely forgotten about what I'll call the, the demand side issues. In other words, who is supporting terrorism? And so it may be the case that madrasas, and for that matter public schools, but particularly madrasas, they may not be contributing to the actual numbers of militants, but the data do suggest that they contribute to communities of support for terrorism, um, their muftis issue fatwas in support of these of this kinds of violence, and it seems likely. And if you, we can talk about the Q and A. But from my militant survey, it seems likely that madrasa students produce or go on to build families that are conducive environments that support um, members going off and joining various jihads. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. That was very very interesting, uh, Matthew. 
Thank you. <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to apologize. I, I hate reading from a speech, but I'm in that uncomfortable position in the first few days after a person leaves the U.S. intelligence community when they're wary of anything they might say, even if it's basically taken from the book they wrote before they went to the intelligence community. So you will bear with me, and uh, I promise during the q and I will look up and look at you in the faces. Um, but I didn't want to miss the conference just because of the post-intelligence community jitters. Um, your uh, comment on communities of support is a, is a perfect uh, segue to a discussion of the Palestinian arena. Again, I, I chose to speak about this because it was the last major research project I did before going back into government. I wrote a book for Yale on Hamas. Uh, and there's a chapter there on, on teaching terror, how Hamas radicalizes Palestinian society. <clears throat> um, and this concept of communities of support uh, is a theme that, that we'll encounter here too. I mean, if Hamas has one supreme objective, it is to mutate uh, what is otherwise an, an, an ethno-political Palestinian national struggle into a fundamentally religious one. And accomplishing this goal uh, uh, transforms Palestinian society, which is relatively secular in nature even today after a year of Hamas government compared to other Muslim societies in the Arab world, into one that is religiously zealous and politically extreme, uh, in, in large part because it creates a community of support. Such a product of radicalization is the goal of many violent Islamist groups, but Hamas, operating a, a grassroots campaign in a limited geographical area, is able to execute a strategically planned radicalization campaign that translates existing social preconditions, uh, Israeli occupation, military checkpoints, lack of Palestinian leadership, lawlessness, and, and many others that we're all aware of, into an active, violent, and radical response. One study of Palestinian suicide bombers, actual terrorists, not just supporters, reveals the critical uh, role that uh, the Hamas Dawa, the Hamas social welfare infrastructure of clinics, schools, mosques, and charities, uh, plays in pushing angry and frustrated Palestinians to the point of committing acts of terrorism. While they acknowledge that no single uh, psychological profile describes the wide variety of Palestinian terrorists, the researchers developed a series of prototypical categories combining both clinical and social psychological causes. Now, a telling corollary to their primary finding is that whatever the typology of the potential terrorist, each required a social environment that is supportive of such an attack, media that disseminates the information among the supportive population, spiritual leadership that encourages such attacks, and financial and social assistance for families uh, and suicide terrorists after their death. Together, these conditions create a comprehensive social environment, a culture of radicalization within Palestinian society. Now, let's be clear, social preconditions of the types we discussed, uh, Israeli occupation, etc., are critical and obviously play a, a tremendous effect, formulative effect, in an environment that facilitates terrorism. But social preconditions by themselves do not make a suicide bomber. While poverty, humiliation, suffering, shame, loss of a loved one are all powerful radicalizing factors. They traditionally require an established terrorist organization to channel that anger and frustration into a desire to kill and maim, maim excuse me, random civilians, as opposed, for example, simply uh, to kill oneself or to engage in uh, more legitimate protest. Increasingly, the Internet now feels some of these functions, as we'll discuss in a little bit, but Hamas's grassroots radicalization campaign on the ground is personal, is eye to eye, and is second to none. What are the goals of the Hamas radicalization campaign and how does it achieve uh, this, uh, this goal? The goals of Hamas's radicalization effort include building grassroots support for the Islamist agenda, writ large, affecting hard to reach populations, including women and children, undermining moderate Palestinian leaders, purchasing goodwill towards Hamas, and logistical support for its operatives, by promoting financial dependency. Hamas charitable and humanitarian organizations not only fund the families of Hamas suicide bombers, they finance important health, education, and welfare projects that are badly needed in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Projects like these play a critical role in building sympathy and support for the group among the local population. Hamas humanitarian projects are usually couched in Islamist terms and are designed to build grassroots support for its religious agenda. For example, Consider that the Treasury Department revealed that Sanabil, the since defunct Hamas front organization then operating in Lebanon, increased its influence in Palestinian refugee camps there 
by first providing basic necessities to needy families and only later requiring these families to fill out application forms, noting whether they had ever worked for Hamas or if they would in the future. For a terrorist organization to have Hamas's spectacular success and influence, it needs to convert to its cause <clears throat> not only disaffected young men, but also children, women, indeed entire families. These groups are less likely to be attracted by the charms of a street militia, but they are easily reached and radicalized by social services networks. In the Islamic society idealized by Hamas, the martyr is the most revered citizen. Palestinian children who are caught up in Hamas Dawah are taught to recognize the virtue of death once indoctrinated into this belief system, they are more easily exploited as grade school terrorists. A 2004 Israeli security report identified a 64% increase in the number of minors involved in terrorism compared to 2003. Uh, Gaza psychologists lamented that, quote, martyrdom has become an ambition for our children. If they had a proper education and a normal environment, they won't have to look for a value in death. Hamas also seeks to equate in the mind of Palestinian parents familial nurturing with nursing hatred. In an interview with National Geographic, a suicide bomber's mother admitted that it was she who instilled in her son the desire for martyrdom and, quote, brought them, meaning her sons, up to become martyrs, to be martyrs for the name of Allah. Her martyred son, Muhammad, uh, had a bedroom adorned with posters of martyred Palestinians and featured a fo photo of himself on the computer screensaver of his younger brother. The mother, by the way, uh, Miriam Farhat, was elected to the Palestinian Legislative Council on the Hamas ticket uh, last January. The vast majority of moderate Palestinian leaders does not share Hamas's Islamist orientation and therefore, in the view of Hamas, must be supplanted in order for the Hamas's vision of Palestinian society to be realized, which is an interesting uh, comment on the recent truce. The Dao is, most successful, is the most successful tool at Hamas's disposal to undermine moderate Palestinian leaders. A Palestinian report submitted to then Chairman Yasser Arafat in June 2000 uh, by his own intelligence uh, uh, service described a meeting in Damascus at which Iranian officials and Hamas leaders agreed, quote, to use the Dawah in the battle for public opinion. But it was much earlier, during a 1993 Hamas meeting in Philadelphia, where Hamas fundraisers decided that, quote, most or almost all of funds collected from that point on should be directed to enhance Hamas and to weaken the self-rule government, meaning the PA. Those who benefit from Hamas largesse support the organization and frequently actively facilitate the group's attacks. In the words of one Israeli defense official, in the territories there are no free lunches. Those who receive help from Islamic associations pay with support. Indeed, Mohammed Anadi, the head of the Holy Land Foundation office near Jerusalem, a Hamas organization uh, indicted for supporting terrorism based in Texas, Acknowledged to criminal investigators that providing services promotes Hamas interests and earns the support of those who benefit from Hamas aid. And to be sure, Hamas social welfare support is largely determined by a cold cost-benefit analysis that links the amount of aid awarded to the support it will buy. <clears throat> now, the process of becoming an adherent of a radical, uh, of radical Islam is fundamentally a didactic process as is the indoctrination to any ideology, whether political, philosophical, or religious. From a young age, Palestinians who participate in the Hamas Dawah, both as agents and subjects, are instructed in the language of radical Islam, schooled in its rationalizations and apologies, and taught in supreme, its supreme virtue and boundless promise. Such an education program requires a student to be constantly supervised, mentored, conjoled, and praised. No wonder, then, that Hamas invests so heavily in schools, campuses, and mosques, controlled environments where impressionable minds are formed and where people go for answers and hope. In 2001, the Islamic Society in Gaza held a graduation ceremony for the some 1,700 children attending its 41 kindergartens. Photographs of the graduation ceremony show preschool children wearing military uniforms, carrying mock rifles. A five-year-old dips her hands in red paint to mimic the bloody hands of Palestinians who had that had proudly displayed them after lynching two Israelis in Ramallah a few years earlier. One child is dressed as Hamas founder Sheikh Yassin, another, uh, and is surrounded by other children costumed as suicide bombers. The radicalization campaign continues through a course of a Palestinian student's academic career, employing materials and, uh, produced and distributed by the Dawah. The Hamas Islamic student movement in the Bethlehem area, for example, distributed to young students so-called instruction cards bearing the pictures of Hamas suicide bombers 
and others killed carrying out terrorist attacks and encouraging Palestinian youth to follow in their footsteps. In addition to schools, Hamas Dawa organizations run summer camps in which Palestinian children are saturated with the group's propaganda and even given semi-military training. According to Hamas's Sheikh Bahar, summer camps are especially successful for indoctrinating religious and secular youth alike. Bahar explained that teaching children the history of Islam while they are surrounded by pictures of martyrs instills in them, quote, seeds of hate against Israel. Radicalization of Palestinian youth, however, is no less prominent at Palestinian institutions of higher learning. <clears throat> Hamas propaganda literally litter Palestinian university campuses. A timetable for university lectures at one campus featured uh, pictures of Hamas suicide bombers. During student elections at Birzeit University in 2003, Hamas candidates reenacted suicide bombings by blowing up models of Israeli buses. In one Birzeit campus debate, Hama a Hamas candidate taunted his Fatah challenger by boasting, quote, Hamas activists in this university killed 135 Zionists. How many did Fatah activists from Berzay kill? With an estimated 11,000 students enrolled in the 2004-2005 academic year, al Najah University in the West Bank is the largest university in the Palestinian territories. Terrorist recruitment, indoctrination, and radicalization of students there is known typically to take place via various student groups, but by far the most prominent of these on this and other campuses, um, is the Hamas-affiliated Al-Qutl Islamiyah, or Islamic Bloc. Of the 13 members of al Najah's 2004 Student Council, eight, including the chairperson, belonged to Hamas's Islamic Bloc. Some of the most notorious Hamas terrorists have held senior positions in the al Najah faction, including, for example, Kays Adwan, former Islamer, Islamic Bloc leader and former head of uh, the Qassam Brigades in the Northern West Bank. Mosques controlled by Hamas members and supporters serve as a nerve center for the group's activities, political, charitable, and military all. Examples of mo mosques that function as radical soapboxes are commonplace, but in addition to the radical rhetoric issued from the pulpits, mosques run by Hamas members and sympathizers are often a bulletin board of propaganda. Their walls plastered with posters and pamphlets glorifying suicide bombers and jailed Hamas militants. In one example, Israeli forces raided the Al Ain Mosque in Al Bira in the West Bank near Ramallah in September 2003 and found posters of suicide bombers on the mosque's front door as well as on walls and notice boards throughout the mosque. But more surprising, soldiers also see leaflets and other Hamas propaganda calling for, quote, many spectacular suicide bombing attacks against U.S. forces in Iraq. Religious study groups held at Hamas-affiliated mosques have also been identified as sources of recruitment and radicalization. Known as an Usra, literally a family, such a group is typically led by an emir, a teacher, who is a Hamas member or sympathizer, and therefore is in a unique position to identify or spot members responsive uh, to radical and Islamist messages. <coughs> but Hamas is also using increasingly the internet to complement its eye-to-eye -eye on the ground radicalization campaign. Hamas produce, uh, publishes a weekly online children's magazine, just one of approximately 20 internet sites the group produces, called Al Fatah, the Conqueror. Launched in September 2002, the site links to other Hamas websites and runs benign children's stories alongside articles preaching the value of carrying out acts of terror, casting suicide bombers as ideal role models for young children and encouraging hatred of Israel and Jews. Issue 38, for example, featured a photograph of the decapitated head of Zainab Abu Salem a female suicide bomber, not from Hamas, but from the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, who detonated her suicide bombing belt in Jerusalem, killing several people in September 2004. The fact that Salem was not a Hamas member did not preclude members of the Hamas media committee from using her severed head to desensitize Palestinian youth to acts of violence. But Al-Fatah has only one of several Hamas websites, which typically feature statements and interviews with group's leaders, martyr photo galleries, video clips of soon-to-be martyrs giving their living wills, as well as articles, posters, and photographs demonizing Israel and glorifying suicide bombers. Hamas also uses the internet to recruit new supporters and members. While some Hamas recruitment efforts have, are active and tangible, such as spotting potential recruits at mosques and religious classes, the internet enables terrorist groups to conduct a virtual recruitment drive that, while passive and intangible, has the capacity to reach out to a far larger audience one that can be reached at any time of day, in any weather, under any conditions, even when neighborhoods are under curfew or under closure, and anywhere, not, in, not just in the West Bank or Gaza Strip. 
To this end, Hamas operates websites in Arabic, English, Russian, French, Farsi, Urdu, and Malay, and our runoff servers in the US, Russia, Ukraine, and Indonesia. Through an impressive combination of these means, including secular and religious institutions, grassroots activism, and globalized media, Hamas successfully radicalizes Palestinians not only to support and fund, but to facilitate and participate in the group's terrorist attacks. And the fact that Hamas, an organization that prides itself on being a local resistance organization, targets foreign audiences from America to Malaysia with its web-based messages should not surprise. The vast majority of Hamas's operating budget is raised abroad. So in the context of the Palestinian uh, situation, if asked to discuss the environment that facilitates terrorism, to me, the critical place to look is the Hamas Dawa. And I would go one step farther. If one were to try and undermine Hamas's radical political agenda, and indeed if one were to be serious about undermining Hamas's terrorist capacity, its military agenda, its Achilles heel is the Dawa, just as it is its uh, best tool to radicalize individuals to create this community of support, uh, which support all three of these parts of its agenda, its political, charitable, and military activities alike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Again, very interesting. And I'm, I see happily the ambassador has joined us. Uh, so I'll turn it over to him right away. I apologize for coming late, but I had another commitment that I have, was absolutely uh, had to go to. If we could move geographically from, from Palestine to, uh, to Africa, and particularly to East Africa and the Horn, my African experience and, um, and research on terrorism have been concentrated in East Africa and the Horn. And in considering environments that enable terrorism, I will suggest lessons from this region. But having also looked at extremism and terrorism elsewhere in Africa, I believe the enablers in this region apply more widely on the African continent and may even have some applicability elsewhere in the world where terrorism and extremism have been a problem. The factors that contribute to extremism and terrorism in East Africa and the Horn and I'll go, in, I'll go into them in more detail in a moment, are poor governance, high levels of corruption, political marginalization and economic and social alienation, endemic poverty, fundamental religious ideology, and extremist external influences, and porous borders. Now one additional factor that seems to play a role in the Middle East and South Asia, but does not appear on my list, is the widespread perception in the Muslim world that U.S. Middle East policy is unbalanced and biased against Muslims. The examples usually cited are the perception that the U.S. has a pro-Israeli position on the Palestinian question and that it engaged militarily in Iraq for the wrong reasons. Although these concerns have some salience in the Muslim inhabited areas of, of East Africa and the Horn, they have not yet reached the point where they make my cut. If pursued imprudently, U.S. policy and Muslim Somalia could move Muslim concerns about U.S. policy above the line. And I'll return to Somalia at the end. It is important to understand two related matters before discussing the enablers of terrorism and extremism. This region, and for that matter, all of Sub-Saharan Africa, experiences far more domestic acts of terrorism each year than it does international acts of terrorism. The international media jump on events such as the bombing of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania or the assassination of an expatriate in Somalia. But many more acts of terrorism are carried out for local reasons by organizations such as the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda or the militant wing of Eritrean Islamic Jihad in Eritrea. Some of these groups, such as the Lord's Resistance Army or the inter ahamwe in Rwanda, are not Muslim, while others, such as the Janjaweed in Sudan, engage in Muslim-on-Muslim -Muslim violence. If the level of death is high enough, domestic terrorism gets reported. More frequently, they are either ignored or minimally covered. The second qualifying point. It's useful to keep in mind the religious configuration of the region. Somalia is about 100% Muslim, while Djibouti is about 94% Muslim. The other countries sit on a religious fault line. 
Sudan is about 70% Muslim, perhaps 5 to 10% Christian, and the rest uh, animist. Eritrea is about 50% uh, Christian and 50% Muslim, while Ethiopia probably has a tiny Christian majority. Tanzania has a 35 to 45% Muslim minority, Kenya a 10 to 20% Muslim minority, and Uganda is about 16% Muslim. Clearly, this is a region that must contend with delicate religious balances. This is also true in many other sub-Saharan African nations. Let me turn to the first issue that uh, I think is one of the enablers, poor governance. Governance problems throughout the region have contributed directly to instability and conflict, which extremists and terrorists, especially the domestic variety, exploit. A 2005 report by the UK's De <coughs> Department for International Development concluded that fragile states are more likely to become unstable and fall prey to terrorist attacks. Uh, Extra-legal changes of government have been common in the region. Following a military coup and subsequent contested elections, Sudan has had the same leader since 1989. No government has been able to establish control over all of Somalia, a failed state since 1991. The current transitional federal government is being sorely tested and its rule is largely dependent on the presence of Ethiopian troops. Relatively brief periods of improved government, go governance all too often have, have been followed by institutional setbacks or growing human rights problems. Democracy has had more success in Tanzania, Kenya, and Somaliland, which unilaterally declared its independence from Somalia in 1991. But even in Tanzania, the electoral process on Muslim Zanzibar has received considerable criticism. Although Tanzanian presidents stepped down according to the Constitution, the same party has controlled the government since independence. The, the March 2006 U.S. National Security Strategy stated that the advance of freedom and human dignity through democracy is the long-term solution to the transnational terrorism of today. The Africa section of the strategy recognized that U.S. security depends upon partnering with Africans to strengthen fragile and failing states and bring ungoverned areas under the control of effective democracies. The U.S. strategy is to promote economic development and the expansion of effective democratic governance so that African states can take the lead in addressing African challenges. U.S. policy specifically calls for reducing corruption, which brings me to the next point. Countries in East Africa and the Horn have generally experienced long periods of autocratic rule and serious problems with corruption. The Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index looked at 163 countries in 2006. Of the six that it ranked in East Africa and the Horn, Eritrea and Tanzania had the best record tied at the 93rd position. Uganda was next best at 105, followed by Ethiopia's ranking of 130. Kenya and Sudan brought up the rear positions at 142 and 156, respectively. None of these rankings is cause for celebration, although there actually has been some modest improvement since 2003 in Eritrea and Uganda. Corruption poses a major challenge for countering terrorism and extremism. Terrorists and criminals have the resources to buy off immigration officials, uh, border checkpoint personnel, the police, and even senior government officials. In Kenya, for example, money laundering and drug trafficking have become enormous problems and are closely associated with corruption. Terrorists and extremists take advantage of corrupt officials just as easily as money launderers and drug dealers. Countering corruption requires considerable time, a great deal of donor, technical and financial assistance, and some brutally frank discussions with African leaders. Turning to political marginalization and social alienation, certain ethnic, religious, and, and regional groups uh, long have experienced, and in many cases continue to experience, political marginalization and or economic and social alienation. Their frustration is manifested in the region's instability and makes these groups more receptive to extremist ideas or terrorist groups. The March 2006 U.S. National Security Strategy acknowledged the importance of political alienation as a cause of terrorism and extremism, noting that transnational terrorists are recruited from people who have no voice in their own government and see no legitimate way to promote change in their own country. Without a stake in the existing order, 
They are vulnerable to manipulation by those who advocate a perverse vision on, um, based on violence and destruction. In Sudan, economically and religiously marginalized Southerners have been in conflict with Northerners almost continually since independence. Marginalized groups in Darfur and Western Sudan have more recently rebelled against the government, while disaffected groups in Eastern Sudan recently reached an accord with the government. Ethiopia has a long history of ethnic discontent, both on its more remote borders and centrally in Oromia. Endemic marginalization in the Somali region has resulted in an active opposition group, the Ogadeni National Liberation Front. In Somalia, different clans remain divided, and there has been a more recent split between secular and fundamentalist Muslims. Within Kenya, the minority Muslim populations on the Swahili coast and, um, and Somalis um, in the northeast never have fully integrated socially or economically. Uganda's marginalization of the Acholi resulted in a debilitating war against the government by the, by the Lord's Resistance Army. Although the Tanzanian mainland continues uh, to be cohesive, residents of Zanzibar see themselves as politically and economically marginalized vis-a-vis -vis the mainland. The, the governments in all of these countries are primarily responsible for taking the steps and implementing policies that divide political power fairly and distribute resources equitably. Unless they commit to improving the situation, there is not much foreign donors can do with aid alone. A Dutch uncle-style dialogue with the leaders in these countries might be more useful than increased assistance. Looking at uh, poverty. One of the poorest regions of the world, poverty is endemic in East Africa and the Horn. The United Nations Development Program's Human Development Index for 2006 ranked 175 independent countries and two other entities. The index considers life expectancy, literacy, education, and the standard of living. Of the seven countries evaluated in East Africa and the Horn, Sudan ranked highest at position 141, followed by Uganda at 145. The remaining countries ranked in the lowest human development category with Ethiopia, the lowest of the seven, in position 170. The link between poverty and terrorism and extremism is the source of a heated global debate. An international group of terrorism experts meeting in Oslo in 2003 to consider the root causes of terrorism concluded that there was only a weak and indirect relationship between poverty and terrorism. They also concluded that there is no single root cause of terrorism or even a common set of causes. Other experts have pointed out that international terrorists and suicide bombers tend to come from relatively well-educated, even middle-class urban backgrounds. Many African leaders insist there is a close correlation. Former Tanzanian President Benjamin, Benjamin Mkapa, for example, said it is futile, if not foolhardy, to think there is no link between poverty and terrorism. The report on the human development uh,